Welcome to Powered by Ancestry. I am Kwesi Kunadu, your host and guide. On this episode, our topic will be witchcraft and ancestry. Yes, I said it, witchcraft. That nasty, caricature, boogeyman word of witchcraft. The goal here is to really get at two concepts that are often fused together, ancestry and witchcraft, particularly when we think about African peoples and people of the African world. And so I want to lay to rest this notion of witchcraft, but to do that, I want to guide us through what it is, what it isn't, how it operates, and what role ancestry plays within the constellation of that particular idea. Now, I want to give you a replacement term, which is bayi. This is a term that used by my Akan folks to refer to what's commonly called witchcraft, though witchcraft doesn't exist in their language. So let's start what we know about this idea of witchcraft or the thing that's called witchcraft. Where does it come from? How does it work? Does it really do what's claimed or alleged to work? We often get these images of either witches on brooms with hats and they're dressed in black and they have big pots and they cook people and children and they fly on their brooms and they are these creatures that are nocturnal and they can enter your dreams, enter your body and do horrible things to you. Witchcraft is also an embedded practice, meaning that it could be none of that. That's often found in Hollywood movies and films and TV shows. But it could be, in fact, uh, anything that refers to a negative act, an act that causes harm, hurt, pain, or death. An act that is so repugnant and so horrible that it's usually dumped into the category of witchcraft. So witchcraft is sort of like a big basket that captures all of the things that are against whatever you might believe in. So witchcraft is a dumping ground, it's like a garbage heap for all the things that you consider to be not like what you believe in, whatever that belief may be. Finally, witchcraft is also a catch-all term for African spirituality. In fact, I remember reading once a white European medical anthropologist concluded that when it comes to African systems of spirituality, health, and healing, everything boils down to witchcraft. End quote. There's reason, therefore, to untangle and, and really deal with this concept of witchcraft because guess whom is often tied to witchcraft? Ancestors. Either they be themselves, quote unquote, witches, or they are the factory producing these witches, or they are the facilitators of the kind of craft used by said witches. Whether the witches be human, actors who are using the force thereof, or they are somehow aligned with the spiritual forces that carry out what we might commonly call witchcraft. What we need to understand is this. The very literature supplied by European empires and slavers and colonists is the same literature that has a long history of their own witchcraft. It's ironic that Africans are commonly referred to as purveyors, as carriers and practitioners of witchcraft, when witchcraft has a long history in European culture, literature, and language. Witchcraft is not an African word, first and foremost. Any African language, witchcraft is not there. And though people can find approximate terms or proximities to it, it doesn't exist. More importantly, witchcraft having its long history within European superstition and folk belief is important to the discussion. So for example, some of the earliest kings of Portugal back in the 13th, 11th, 12th century used to engage in these superstitions and folk beliefs. They would, for instance, at the dining table, royal dining table, have toad's wart or lizard's tongue or a serpent's tail, and they would mix these in potions and concoctions. Or some of you might remember these folk tales about Merlin the magician, right? And using these parts of animals and human beings to conjure up and to cause harm or injury or danger or death to people. And this is just a slice of it all. More importantly, this European witchcraft has the audacity to say that, well, African peoples are the originators and purveyors of witchcraft, when in fact, the very thing that they speak of has a long and strong and deep history in their own cultures and their own societies. Look no further than their mythical creatures, the Dracula, the vampire, the goblin, the goons, and other kinds of, of hideous creatures and monsters, and of course, the witch, right? The witch. In this country called the United States, we might remember the Salem Witch Trial, where women were hunted, tortured, beaten, and killed because of their notion of witchcraft. So I want to put that on the table. By that I mean 
this long, deep-rooted history of European notions of witchcraft and practice that had nothing to do with Africa or African peoples. And then I want to come to this notion of Bayi. You see, Bayi is sort of a stand-in, a representative of other concepts within other African languages and societies, and of course within the African diaspora, because African people moved over the last 400 years. And they carried with them, in mind, memory, and in practice, their own ideas of spiritual culture. Their notion of so-called witchcraft has nothing to do with the European notion of witchcraft. To them, Bayi is a neutral force, not a negative force. Think of Bayi like a hammer. It can build a house or destroy it. Think of Bayi as your pharmaceutical drug that you pick up from the pharmacy. It can alleviate your pain or expedite parts of your healing. But it can also, what, harm, maim, and kill you. Who's to blame? The drug, or the hammer, or the user? This is what these African Kavmali teaches us. It teaches that Bayi is a neutral force. It is shaped by the intention of the user. And so African cosmologies rest this notion of Bayi on the user, but more importantly, on the intent of the user. You see, the most powerful weapon of so-called witchcraft is our mouth. It's what we say. When we call a child stupid, that's Bayi. We're using the instrument or tool of our mouth and our minds to communicate to this child that they are less than a thriving human being. When we call our spouses idiots, despicable, trash, we are using the instrument of our mouth and minds to literally curse them. Not simply with curse words, but to curse them in the tradition of so-called witchcraft. And so if that child begins to act stupid, well, you have laid out the conditions to make it manifest. You don't need any ritual with frogs or serpent's tails or other kinds of animal or plant or features of the natural world. Our mouth and our minds are the most powerful tools for enacting and activating so-called witchcraft or bayi. The intent in our head and the mechanisms of our mouth makes that possible. And that's why I want to move us away from the notion of witchcraft. Because that language is a violent language. Just by saying witchcraft or calling someone a witch is an act of violence. It is a curse of cursings. But think about bayi, neutral energy, neutral force, that can be what? Activated and shaped for a particular end or purpose. The issue is not the hammer or the tool. The issue is the user. Our minds, our spirits are so powerful potentially that we can think ill thoughts for someone and they can get sick. You can literally make someone feel awful and they can get sick. We know this. We can talk a coworker, a friend, a colleague, and make them feel so low and small that they begin to feel unwell. That's a misuse of our power, but that's Bayi. We have to be both on offense and on defense. This is where our ancestors come in. Bayi, as a neutral force, can be neutralized itself when activated. So when we are cursed, when we feel low and little, when we are the target of other people's ill intent and actions, we call upon our ancestors to play defense, to neutralize that force. Or we can also go on offense, but by offense, I don't mean revenge. By offense, I mean providing protection against the potential and possibility of Bayi used against you. For those of you that are watching this, you may be surprised by the hundreds of thousands of millions of people in this world whose lives have been upended and affected by Bayi, and they have no idea that it's Bayi. Or that it is what? The ill intent, the ill regard, negative energy and spirit of someone or someones acting toward them. Yesterday, I saw in the news a house somewhere in New York City that was struck by a Molotov cocktail by someone late at night who didn't show their face. They came in front of the car, parked in front of the house, threw the cocktail, and then ran off. That to me is an analogy or metaphor for, for the use of Bayi. Ill intent, Molotov cocktail, meaning there's nothing positive that's possible if you're carrying a Molotov cocktail to somebody's house. <laughs> Ill intent. And to strike that house with the Molotov cocktail to produce what? A net negative outcome, a fire that may injure, harm, or kill those inside the house. And guess what? Because the person was unidentifiable, there's nobody to know who did it. That's why we need to have protective and defensive measures through our ancestry. Often we don't know who's doing this, but the ancestors do because they have our backs, our sides, our fronts, and our bottoms. 
They can see ahead and behind. And having a connection to your ancestry allows for that offensive play and defensive play combined together. And that's why we have to be on offense and defense through our ancestry. And in doing so, you will live a more productive, a much more whole and healthier, but also a much more connected life through ancestry against the forces of Bayi or so-called witchcraft. I'm Kwesi Konadu. I've been your guide and host for this episode of Power by Ancestry. Please drop your comments or questions in the comment section or ideas for future episodes. Looking forward to seeing you next time. Stay well.